Good morning. I'm glad you could be with me today as we study God's Word together in the Unfolding the Word ministry. We're in the midst of a study of 1 Thessalonians. Today we open up our study of the fourth chapter. Listen now as I begin to read from chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. As you've been with me now, we finished our study of chapter 3, which was primarily focused on trials in the Christian life, some of what was driving those trials and lessons that we need to learn out of them. The fourth chapter begins by a shift in focus, and now he's Paul, under direction of the Holy Spirit, is talking about living to please God. And this commitment to pleasing God, we're going to talk more about that, is central to the New Testament, actually all of the Bible. And particularly fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians picks up on three areas that are intimately woven into a life that pleases the Lord. Now, of course, no one ends up being able to please the Lord unless they have found Jesus Christ as their Savior, because that's the only solution to our sin, the only thing that reconciles us to God. But having been reconciled to God, we have a life ahead of us that can either be lived displeasing to the Lord or pleasing to the Lord. The three areas, getting back to it, involve sexual purity, love for the brothers and sisters, and living a life that wins the respect of outsiders. Now, let's move on in this study. I want to begin by building more on this challenge, this command that's clearly here, to please God with our lives. God expressly makes it plain to us that we are to please God as an orientation of life. Our lives are no longer our own. If we've been redeemed and are now his children, our lives are his. Our continued presence in this world is to serve his purpose and to fulfill his will. I was thinking in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, God puts it this way for us. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves in the same way with the same thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for their human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. Okay? The time is past for living like the Gentiles. Live the rest of our life for the will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 puts it this way. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. <coughs> Excuse me, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And of course, he's talking about believers because the unbeliever doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's indwelling presence is one of the outcomes of salvation. You were bought with a price. Live the rest of your life for the will of God. <laughs> Pretty plain, isn't it? And these are just a couple of verses, but we would find that message repeatedly throughout the Scripture, and especially in the New Testament. God wants us, calls for us, to live lives pleasing to Him. We are to choose that lifestyle. He doesn't force us into it. We have to choose it. Ephesians 5.10 puts it this way. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, why would we try to discern that? Because we want to do it. All right, there's the logic of it. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 puts it this way. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, pleasing God. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. He says, we, we make it our aim to please God. Can that be said about you, that it is your aim in life to please the Lord? Now, of course, I said no one can please the Lord until they have repented of sin and received Christ as their Savior, resting in his work on their behalf on the cross. That settles us in a way eternally because we pass out of judgment into life. But as we discovered in that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 passage I just read to you, uh, while we passed out of that type of judgment, God still puts us in a place where our lives will be discerned as his redeemed children at the judgment seat of Christ, the bema of Christ in the Greek, the place where our efforts are discerned to discover whether we've lived pleasing to him, bearing fruit that lasts, or whether we have little to show for the redeemed life that we now have. Choosing to find what pleases the Lord and then live it. Therein is our challenge. In the fourth chapter now of First, of, uh, first Thessalonians gives us direction on central ingredients in a lifestyle pleasing to the Lord. We're going to talk more about those in a minute. A couple of examples we encounter in the scriptures about this pleasing the Lord uh, that I want to share with you again to build on this initial challenge. In Hebrews chapter 11, in the faith chapter of scripture, in verses 5 and 6, we read about Enoch. And listen to these words. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's why I say you can't even turn attention to pleasing God until you've pleased him by salvation, by faith, <laughs> repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. But beyond that, clearly Enoch was living in such a way that he pleased God. Are you living in the way that pleases God? I was thinking about the Lord Jesus. He makes our person example that we get out of Hebrews 11 with that phrase, pleasing God. But Jesus also is described as pleasing God. In John 8, 29, listen to these words. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could even say, I mostly do the things that please him. The Lord Jesus pleased the Heavenly Father absolutely and in all circumstances. Great goal for us that we could say, I am living in a way that I'm doing the things that please the Lord. God wants us to live pleasing to him as his redeemed children. And he wants us to be clear about what that means. It simply makes absolutely no sense for God to challenge us in such a way and then not tell us what pleases him. It's not meant to be a guessing game. God specifies what pleases him, and we are to align with such things. The scriptures define it. The Holy Spirit convicts us about it, and we are meant to act. And so he says, listen, you know the instructions we gave you in the Lord Jesus. I've been already teaching you about what pleases the Lord. Move forward and do it. This word instruction, by the way, and I want to end with this today, is an interesting phrase. Now, it's a word in, in verse 2 here that literally describes military orders. You know, your instructions are, here's the order from the commander. Do this. Go in this direction. The soldier is intended to be guided by such orders. These are the marching plan for the day. <laughs> the the uh, upper commanders have determined, this is what I'm supposed to do. My job is do it. Get out and to the best of our ability, achieve that end. We are expected as soldiers of the king to obey the marching orders he gives us. 
In that, we end up pleasing the Lord. So what are these marching orders? Well, in one sense, we could say all of the scripture is the marching order, where God defines for us again and again and again all of those things that are his will and please him. But particularly here in the fourth chapter, God is identifying three major issues that he is going to give us direction about so that we, in so obeying them, please him. Tomorrow we'll begin the first of those having to do with sexual purity. Then we will turn to the issue of the love of the brethren. And finally, we will talk about the lifestyle we follow in living responsibly in such a way that we win the respect of outsiders. Join me as we move forward in the fourth chapter to understand more and more of what it means to live pleasing to the Lord as redeemed children of God. Join me then, won't you? God bless.